Hello and welcome to another Sutton Brain Hub video. My name is Benjamin and in this exciting new series we will explore the physiology and neuroanatomy of a number of different psychiatric conditions, starting with Tourette's syndrome. This is a condition that has been in the public eye recently, with high profile figures like Billie Eilish and Louis Capaldi publicly suffering the symptoms that typify the syndrome. So, what exactly is Tourette's syndrome? Tourette's syndrome is a neuropsychiatric condition that typically develops during childhood and is characterized by attacks of repetitive and involuntary muscle contractions that can either produce stereotypical movements like eye blinking or head jerking or sounds like throat clearing or grunting. These attacks of involuntary muscular contractions can be significantly debilitating to a person suffering with the condition and tend to occur in bouts, waxing and waning over the course of time. They tend to be preceded by a so-called premonitory urge, a herald sign like a scratchy feeling in the throat that tells the individual that contractions may be coming. Since the brain plays a central role in the production of movement, in order to understand what causes these characteristic symptoms, we first need to recap some relevant bits of neuroanatomy. Voluntary movement is linked to a strip of grey matter that lies on the posterior part of the frontal lobe. Impulses originate in this so-called primary motor strip and the signal is conducted down the corticospinal tract to the lower motor neurons. These in turn terminate at the motor end plate and induce a skeletal muscle contraction. The other neuroanatomical structures that we need to recap are the so-called basal ganglia which are a series of interconnected nuclei in the forebrain, midbrain, and diencephalon. In primates, these include the striatum, subthalamic nucleus, globus pallidus, and the substantia nigra, which you may remember is the site of degeneration implicated in the movement disorder Parkinson's disease, which presents classically with cogwheel rigidity, bradykinesia, and tremor. From what we know of Parkinson's disease, we can infer that these basal ganglia circuits have a role to play in movement control. And various lines of research suggest that it's the dysfunction in these circuits and their connections with frontocortical circuits that is central to the understanding of Tourette's syndrome pathophysiology. So, how do these basal ganglia circuits control movement in healthy individuals? This schematic is attempting to describe the various excitatory, inhibitory and modulatory impulses that govern the control of movement, and its convolutedness is testament to the complexity of the system and the incredible design of the human brain. We may infer that this signal on the left is part of the corticospinal tract, the excitatory impulse that is initiated in the precentral gyrus and controls voluntary movement through the brainstem, spinal cord, and lower motor neurons. Although this is the main excitatory output tract, fine tuning of the impulse is achieved through complex interactions between the basal ganglia circuits. Let's start at the striatum. The striatum is a bundle of neurons that receives excitatory input from virtually all of the cerebral cortex, using glutamate as the neurotransmitter, and this pathway is called the corticostriatal projection. As we can appreciate, the striatum also receives dense input from the dopamine-containing neurons of the substantia nigra pars compacta. This input is thought to modulate transmission from the cerebral cortex to the striatum. The globus pallidus pars interna and substantia nigra pars reticula are the primary output nuclei, and these send inhibitory output to thalamus and brainstem targets, which would have the effect of attenuating the motor impulse that is sent down the spinal cord. Acting somewhat in parallel is the circuit that includes the subthalamic nucleus. When a voluntary movement is initiated by cortical mechanisms, a separate excitatory signal is sent to the subthalamic nucleus. The subthalamic nucleus projects in a widespread pattern and excites the globus pallidus pars interna. The increased GPI activity causes inhibition of thalamocortical and brainstem motor mechanisms. All this begs the question, why would you actually want inhibition when you're trying to initiate a movement? Well, all this is actually about fine tuning. Specifically, when a movement is initiated by a particular group of neurons termed a motor pattern generator, basal ganglia output neurons projecting to other competing motor pattern generators increase their firing rate. The result this has is that it actually increases inhibition in those generators. In addition, other basal ganglia output neurons projecting to the very generators involved in the desired movement decrease their discharge. 
Therefore, the intended movement is enabled and competing movements are prevented from interfering with the desired one. The net result of basal ganglia activity during a voluntary movement is the inhibition of competing motor patterns and focused facilitation from the selected voluntary movement pattern generators. So now that we have some understanding of how motor control is initiated and fine-tuned by the basal ganglia, we can suggest a neurobiological model for how the tics that characterize Tourette syndrome are produced. The model goes like this. In Tourette's, a discrete set of striatal neurons becomes inappropriately active without any stimulus from the frontal cortex or other cortices. They are, in effect, going rogue, and thus are not acting to inhibit competing motor pattern generators during the initiation of a movement. One result of these rogue striatal neurons could be the unwanted and aberrant inhibition of a discrete group of GPI neurons. These now abnormally inhibited GPI neurons are unable to send their inhibitory impulse to a specific unwanted competing motor pattern, and thus these motor patterns persist and become initiated. If a specific set of striatal neurons were to become overactive in discrete, repetitive episodes, the result would be a repeated, stereotyped, unwanted movement, or a tick. So, what actually causes these rogue striatal neurons to become active in Tourette syndrome? Well, one theory suggests that it's all related to the increased activity of dopamine in the striatum. To back this up, one study used single photon emission computed tomography, or SPECT, to image the brains of individuals with Tourette syndrome. And interestingly, what they noticed was that there was increased dopamine transporter binding in the striatum of Tourette syndrome sufferers compared to healthy individuals. Other literature still notes that pharmacological blockade of dopamine receptors in humans seems to decrease ticks. Thank you for listening. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram and be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel as we continue to explore the mysteries of the brain.